you know, I, I sort of feel like we can start going maybe when we have 275 people. In the meantime, do any of you guys have any good psilocybin jokes? Like psilocybin science and research jokes? Oh, gosh. I can't think of jokes on command usually. I'm really yeah. bad at that. <laughs> I wish I had that skill. Um, <laughs> That would be a good one to have. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. someone on the chat did, though. They said two uh, mushrooms walked into a bar. They were fun guys. Mm -hmm. Nice. That was good. That's like the punchline to every mushroom joke, though. <laughs> fun guys? Yeah. <laughs> the, sec the second part of the joke is you, you say um, they're fun guys, but then they, you, why did they leave the party? Because there wasn't mushroom. Oh, uh. <laughs> Johnny, you do have some. You just, nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we have. We've got it. We've got two hundred seventy-five people. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Psilocybin Summit. This is our second talk on Thursday, the free day. Super, super glad you're here. Um, just one note, if you're having technical issues, please go to psilocybinsummit.com and fill out the form there. And yeah, and then somebody will help you. And we're going to be talking today about the effects and possible mechanisms of psilocybin therapy among patients with mental health problems. And we're having presentations by three wonderful researchers. Um, I assume that the other two of you are wonderful. I only have firsthand <laughs> experiential knowledge of the wonderfulness of one of these presenters. And, but he says, you, he said, you guys are great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna believe you. So my dear friend, Alan Davis, is a licensed clinical psychologist and assistant professor of social work at The Ohio State University and adjunct assistant professor of psychiatry at John Hopkins University. Dr. Davis's clinical and research training was motivated by answering the following question. Why do evidence-based psychotherapies fail and how, we, how can we improve them? As part of his training, he worked primarily with adults in a variety of community and clinical research settings, including academic medical centers, university clinics, community programs, and long-term acute care hospitals, delivering a variety of evidence-based and experimental psychotherapies to individuals diagnosed with substance use, trauma-related mood and anxiety disorders. Grounded in a humanistic and process-oriented approach, such interventions included motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, harm reduction, acceptance and commitment therapy, cognitive processing and prolonged exposure therapies, and psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. These clinical approaches were complemented by extensive research training, wherein he had broad exposure to different research methodologies and advanced statistical techniques. Consistent with his clinical interests, his research interests and expertise focus on contributing to the knowledge and a of an ability to help those suffering with substance use and mental health problems. Understanding how to improve clinical outcomes through examining novel treatments and developing ways to conceptualize substance use and mental health problems through a strength-based approach have been the guiding framework of his professional career. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. Um, I always think that it's, I haven't gotten all the information in my bio until I hear someone else read it. I'm like, okay, that's way too much information. I need to cut it down for the next time. <laughs> next year, um, next, year next year you get a hundred words. Yeah, next year it's just going to be a collage of pictures of me in like various research settings. Um, I feel like that'll, that'll be fun. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, so we can get started. And that's, this should be... What everyone is seeing. If uh, if there's a problem with anyone seeing this, let me know. 
So this talk uh, for today, as uh, Dan mentioned, we have three of us presenting today. So I'm going to take a little bit of time at the beginning to share some findings from our recently completed psilocybin trial for people with major depression, including not only our primary findings, but also we just wrapped up our long-term 12-month um, follow-up, and so I'll be sharing some of that data. And then we'll have two other presentations today, one by um, uh, two or two by uh, Source Research Research Foundation grant recipients, uh, and they're going to be um, talking a little bit about psilocybin and uh, outcomes from psilocybin therapy, as well as some uh, possible mechanisms of, of effect. So, and then we'll wrap up with some time for questions. So, as any research study uh, and really kind of any other project that I've ever been involved in, uh, it couldn't happen without a team of folks. And this is the team that was primarily involved with the depression trial um, at Johns Hopkins, uh, including Roland Griffiths and Fred Barrett. Uh, Mary Casamano was our lead guide on the trial uh, and pretty much taught me everything I know about psilocybin therapy. Um, and this project was funded by a variety of individual donors, um, the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation, um, as well as uh, by a grant Grant from River Sticks, Hefter, NIDA, and uh, this study was also crowdsourced. Um, we had funding from a crowdsourcing campaign that was organized by Tim Ferriss. So, uh, what is it about this intervention that um, excited us and, and kind of how are we thinking about psilocybin therapy? Well, the way that uh, I think most of the literature has focused on psilocybin therapy has been talking about the mystical experience and and the types of spiritual things that might happen during a psilocybin session. And that's certainly a piece of the puzzle, although I think uh, early on in my work with psilocybin therapy, I realized that there were times when people had no spiritual experience or mystical experience, and they had lots of other types of experiences. And there were times when people had mystical experiences, but they also had a variety of other difficult experiences, challenging experiences, um, and insight experiences where they gain some knowledge or new information about themselves or others or their life or their, or their relationships or their future, where they wanted to go in life. Um, and so what we started thinking about was, well, what happens when insight and mystical experiences happen together. And what we call this is quantum change, which unfortunately we did not uh, coin this term. We actually discovered that there's a, um, there's a really interesting book on the topic uh, that was not about psychedelic related quantum change, uh, uh, but it was about rapid and enduring transformations that occurred spontaneously when people would have non-drug uh, occasioned um, quantum change experiences. Uh, in the context of uh, big other types of changes in their life, like um, quitting drinking or quitting drugs if they had a problem with those uh, substances. So we were curious to explore this a little bit more in this study. And what we did was we had 24 patients enroll in our trial. This was a, a waitlist controlled trial, which means that about half of the people were allocated to a waiting list where they had to wait eight weeks before they started their psilocybin therapy. And the other half could get started right away. Our primary objective for this trial was to examine the rapid and sustained antidepressant effects of psilocybin. So we wanted to see how quickly does it work and if it does work, um, how long does it last? So we're, uh, we followed them uh, after their treatment up to 12 months um, after they were finished. This uh, shows you a little bit of the, the process of, of how folks uh, experience their intervention. Uh, so what we had here is uh, the top uh, little line there where it says immediate treatment are those that got started right away. They had preparation meetings for about eight hours of therapy with two facilitators and um, followed by two psilocybin sessions uh, separated by about two weeks. The first psilocybin session was what we call a moderate high dose at 20 milligrams per 70 kilogram. Second session was 30 milligrams per 70 kilogram. And then after that, we uh, continued to meet with them for integration therapy um, uh, through one month, which uh, was our primary outcome. And then of course, at every follow up through 12 months. Uh, the people in the delayed treatment, they got the exact same treatment. They just uh, had to wait eight weeks before they could begin um, the active part of the treatment and begin their preparation therapy. What you see here is that we had to screen for eligibility almost 900 people um, in order to get 
enough people who qualified to be in this study. Uh, we excluded the vast majority of them, about 800, uh, mostly for geographical reasons. So a lot of the people who wanted to get into the study just weren't close enough to Baltimore um, to manage coming in, you know, for 18 visits um, to the site. So um, we ended up excluding most of them for that reason. We did end up bringing into a more in-depth uh, screening process about 70 folks, um, leading to about 27 that qualified and enrolled and 24 that completed the study. On average, uh, the sample was composed of, uh, I, I hate to say that 39 is middle-aged because I just turned 40 and I don't feel middle-aged, but um, I think technically that's middle-aged. Um, so on average, they're around 40 years old. Uh, we had more women, uh, or technically we had more biologically female um, individuals in this uh, trial than male. Um, the vast majority, uh, though, were white and heterosexual. Um, importantly, they had been experiencing their current depressive episode for at least two years on average across everyone in the study. And most folks had had depression on and off for decades um, with very little or no help from antidepressants or psychotherapy. Here's our uh, big bang primary finding, which is that there was a large statistically significant and very large decrease in depression scores after the psilocybin intervention among those in the immediate group, that's the green group on your screen, um, and the blue group was our waiting list time uh, group, which means that there were no changes in their depression while they were waiting for the treatment, which on the one hand sounds like, well, no, duh, why would their depression just go away? Um, but that's an important control to establish that it wasn't just because of the passage of time. It wasn't that there were other fluctuations in their depression, but in fact, it really was because of the psilocybin intervention that we saw a decrease in depression um, after treatment. And then what we did is we could be put everyone in the same group. So after everyone got um, all the therapy and we looked at that primary difference to see whether or not those in the immediate group um, had a change uh, different or had a decrease um, and uh, uh, that there was no decrease in the uh, delay group, we then collapsed everyone into one group and just said overall, after everyone had treatment, what was the finding? And what you see here is that there was a very large, again, and significant decrease in depression across everyone in the study from baseline to one week after the psilocybin therapy was over, and that that was maintained up to four weeks later. Now, one of the important things here uh, that is not readily recognizable is that our effect size for this treatment, uh, which is the D value, where it says D equals 3.6, that is about four times greater than the effect sizes seen in typical antidepressant treatments. Um, and it's about two and a half times larger than the effect sizes seen in the, in the typical psychotherapy literature. So this is not just a um, uh, powerful treatment, but this is this kind of blows other treatments out of the water. Uh, now it's important to keep in mind, this is a small trial. It does not have a placebo control. So there's certainly more studies that need to be done to continue to examine whether this effect is as large as it is, but this is the first controlled study um, of psilocybin therapy in uh, the broader population of people with major depression, and that we're seeing such a big effect um, is certainly an important piece of this um, line of research. Um, this is our figure that shows that the changes in depression happen pretty quick. So the prior figures that I showed you were at one week after both psilocybin sessions and four weeks after both psilocybin sessions. What this figure is showing you is that this is, we took, we actually measured depression the day after their first psilocybin session. And so what we see here is that in, in this group, depression really decreased after that first psilocybin session, and it then maintained a decreased rate through the second psilocybin session up through the four-week follow-up. So it seems to be, at least in this study, that depression reduced rather quickly and that um, it then kind of remained low um, up to four weeks after the treatment was done. What you see here is that for uh, anyone who has either known someone or has experienced depression themselves, <clears throat> you'll know that anxiety is a piece of that puzzle uh, for a lot of people with depression. And what we saw in our study was that similarly, anxiety was reduced um, in uh, those who got psilocybin treatment uh, and that anxiety actually went up a little bit during the delay period for those that had to wait to get psilocybin, which makes sense. In fact, you know, working with them as a guide, one of the things that they frequently mentioned was, you know, 
oh my gosh, I was so excited to get into study and now you want me to wait eight weeks. Um, and so that was very challenging for a lot of folks. Um, but psilocybin also seemed to reduce suicidal ideation uh, in the group. Uh, there were no differences between groups. So actually those people in the delay group also experienced a reduction in suicidal ideation during the delay, even before they got psilocybin, which we think has to do with the fact that they finally had maybe a little bit of hope that maybe something was going to benefit them from the treatment. And so they were feeling a little bit optimistic about the future. What you see here is a, uh, uh, our clinical response rates. Uh, clinical response is defined as a greater than or equal to 50% decrease in depression uh, from the treatment. And at one week after treatment, uh, about two thirds of the folks in the study had a clinically significant response. And 71% at four weeks had a clinically significant response. In terms of remission, uh, that's complete remission from depression, which uh, we rate that as falling below seven on our clinician administered depression scale. Um, so uh, according to this, um, we had about 58% at one week who were in remission completely from depression. And that 54% of the sample were in remission at four weeks. Now, coming back to the point that I raised at the beginning about quantum change, uh, so when mystical and insight experiences happen together, um, is that potentially one of the things that uh, helped the folks in this study? Well, what we found were that mystical experiences or the intensity of the mystical experience was moderately related to change in depression. So the, the greater intensity of mystical experience, the more decrease in depression at four weeks. Um, but we found an even stronger relationship between psychological insight um, that was gained during the psychedelic experience and changes in depression. So the more intense they received these new awarenesses and discoveries and realizations um, about their life, uh, that that was correlated pretty strongly with uh, a decrease in depression at the follow-up. So one of the things that we were really interested in is long-term outcomes. And I know that Gabby is going to present on some long-term outcomes from a different study where they followed people for much, much longer. But for this trial, we started following people for 12 months as an initial step to see, you know, did this, did this treatment last um, beyond just a month uh, after treatment? And what we found was that in, uh, it, it certainly did, that uh, for our study, uh, not only did we see this drop, but that the drop in depression uh, was maintained overall for the overall sample up to 12 months later. Now, what you notice might notice about these pink lines on your screen is that they're pretty wide, uh, which, which what that means is that there's some people who they did not experience this the entire time. There, there were several people who relapsed, um, their depression came back, um, it did not work for everyone, but as a whole, as a group, their depression was less than what it was um, coming into the study. So even if, they, even if the depression came back, it typically came back to a less um, intense degree than it was before. Um, what you see here is that there was also no difference in the long-term outcomes between groups, uh, that they both groups, regardless of whether they were in the delay group or the immediate treatment group, that they um, all kind of experienced a decrease in depression. Um, I want to highlight again, though, that, you know, it doesn't mean that there weren't some individuals who had a, you know, a relapse and, and their depression came back and were just really starting to dig into um, what was different about those people, the people that maybe had their depression come back versus those that didn't. Um, but overall, depression was reduced in this group. In terms of remission and the long-term outcomes, uh, what you see here is that at 12 months after treatment, 58% uh, of the sample were still considered in complete remission from depression. So a little over half of our sample um, were uh, depression-free for up to a year. And, and as a reminder, these are people who on average had been depressed for decades um, with little or no help from traditional antidepressants or psychotherapy. So that psilocybin therapy produced such a, a strong change um, uh, is really exciting for them on a personal level, certainly exciting for us um, at the investigator and trial level to be able to, to show this effect of psilocybin therapy. So what does this tell us? This tells us at least for, you know, from our vantage point that mystical type and psychological insight experiences are really robust, that they are, um, uh, when accompanied with psychological support and safety, that they are able to you know, at least be part of the explanation of why people are experiencing an antidepressant effect. 
We also think that it could explain a transdiagnostic effect that perhaps, you know, when people have these mystical and insight experiences together, that it could produce change in a variety of different types of problems that people experience, whether that's traumatic experience um, or the resolution of trauma um, or other types of difficulties. Um, we also continue to, to, to show that people report these experiences as the most psychologically insightful and spiritually significant experience of their lives. Um, but there's definitely more work that needs to be done. Um, there's great uh, new scales that have been coming out of Imperial where they've been looking at emotional breakthroughs and ego dissolution, sensed presences. Um, and I'm sure there's a variety of other mechanisms that are known and unknown that we need to explore and look at how those are also related to mystical and insight experiences. And this has led us to um, develop several new trials that are coming up, including for patients with PTSD, opioid use, um, co-occurring alcohol and depression and, and others. Um, and we also have current survey studies to start looking at if this applies in different populations. So we're, we're, we've um, uh, translated all of our typical mystical and insight scales into Spanish and we're exploring whether uh, native Spanish speaking individuals experience these things in the same way. So um, definitely lots more work that needs to be done. Oh, uh, sorry, I just went over all of that. <laughs> um, all right, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we're going to probably hold questions for the individual talks um, until uh, we're finished with all three, and then we'll have questions at the end. So I'm going to now uh, turn this over to uh, Dr. Gabby Eigenleaves. Should I read your bio, Gabby? Sure, if you'd like to do that, go ahead. Yeah. You can do that while I get my screen. Sure. Gabby is a clinical psychologist and National Institute on Drug Abuse funded research fellow at the Wheel Institute for Neuroscience Department of Psychiatry, UCSF. She received her PhD in clinical psychology from Palo Alto University. Her doctoral research focused on the clinical applications of psilocybin-assisted therapy and mindful self-compassion-based interventions to treat mood, substance use, and trauma-based disorders. Gabby's work draws on quantitative and qualitative methodologies to explore underlying psychological and neurobiological mechanisms responsible for catalyzing behavioral changes, including emotion regulation, meta-awareness, and pro-sociability. Pro -sociality. Gabby's current research is focused on the use of opioid replacement therapies to treat opioid use disorder and chronic pain. She's also exploring the use of behavioral paradigms to prevent relapse and restructure dysregulated motivational reward systems involved in addiction. Great. Cool. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, so I'm going to be presenting some research from um, uh, a research group that I was involved with at NYU um, uh, over the past several years, similar to uh, Dr. Davis's findings and um, going to be presenting some research that was co-published with the folks at Johns Hopkins um, in 2016 and then from a paper that I recently published this year on long-term um, outcomes uh, several years later. So I just want to um, disclose the, um, the grant support that um, funded the, both the parent study and the long-term follow-up study, the Source Research Foundation, um, of which Dr. Davis is the president, supported the, um, the long-term study that I'll talk about in a second. So, um, I'm going to start by describing uh, the sort of primary outcome of focus in uh, both trials, which is existential stress, distress um, associated with the cancer diagnosis. And then I'll talk about the parent study, which was published in 2016. Um, lead investigator of that study was Dr. Stephen Ross. Then I'll talk about long term follow up study that I um, led uh, and published this year. And then some qualitative findings and then discuss some psychological mechanisms that might be at play here. So um, as you might expect or have experienced yourself or have a you know, loved one um, who's had to 
cope with either a cancer diagnosis or um, a life-threatening illness. Uh, the diagnosis of um, an illness like this can provoke extreme despair, um, an existential crisis for people. Um, and there is a construct that was defined relatively recently in the literature um, called existential distress that refers to this loss of meaning, demoralization, um, loss of hope. Um, and it's becoming increasingly recognized in the literature that this is an area um, of you know, important, important need when it comes to um, clinical focus. But for a long time really was not discussed in the literature. And there are some, some evidence-based interventions that target the specific domain of distress, um, sort of existential distress that's not really captured by uh, other domains like depression and anxiety. There, there's overlap, but it is kind of a unique domain. Um, and some of those interventions are supportive expression group therapy, uh, meaning-centered psychotherapy, dignity therapy, however, um, there are no existing pharmacological treatments that um, target this specific existential distress. Um, so this is where psilocybin, um, you know, may come into play. So here I have some, some quotes from participants in our trial who um, were describing their distress prior to the intervention with psilocybin. Um, and here you see there are um, descriptions of feeling very stuck. I spent a lot of time being very depressed about my cancer, very stuck. I was told I have a 50-50 chance, chance of being alive in five years. As soon as you think about having limited time, it changes everything. Um, here another participant was coping by running, um, kind of avoiding, uh, avoiding his experience with cancer, it's constant motion. Um, if you think your mind is clogged and you can't think of anything, it is like your mind is clogged and you can't think of anything else. So people really describing um, feeling kind of paralyzed by their, by their fear uh, as they're facing their, their cancer diagnosis. So I'm gonna spend a quick, um, a quick bit of time discussing the parent trial, which was, which was published in 2016. Um, and then I'll talk about the long-term follow-up results. So the um, parent study was a, technically a, a phase two. So um, those refer to different drug development phases and usually phase two has sample size um, roughly in the kind of 15 to 30. We had 29 participants um, in this study and we, the design involved uh, one dose of psilocybin, uh, 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, um, to be some body weight. So most people ended up getting somewhere between 25 to 30 milligrams of psilocybin. Um, versus a, um, a crossover control. So every participant in the study served as their own control um, and had both psilocybin, received both psilocybin and niacin plus supportive psychotherapy. And those sessions were separated by seven weeks, so almost two months in between those sessions with a crossover at the, at the seven week point. And um, so as I described on the first slide, here um, here is the, the kind of a, a visual depiction of the um, the design. So everyone um, had three sessions of preparatory therapy at the beginning, and then a se session, a medication session with either psilocybin or niacin, um, the placebo, or the other way around, niacin first followed by psilocybin. And then our primary outcomes, uh, we looked at anxiety. Uh, measured by the HADs, depression, the back depression inventory, and then we had a number of secondary outcomes um, focused on existential distress, quality of life, uh, spirituality, and then we also did safety assessments. Um, so I threw up here a picture of our um, study room. This is actually not the room that uh, the cancer study was um, was held in. This is a the current the current medication room, um, but the typical session, which looks very similar at Johns Hopkins, is um, a two therapists dia, two therapists, one participant, um, and usually an eight hour session where the participant has eye shades, pre recorded music, 
um, playlist coming through the headphones and the attention, we um, you know, encourage them to direct their attention inward for the duration of the session. And then there were some blood pressure um, measurements and most of the talking and sort of therapy uh, processing took place in later sessions. So primary outcomes here. Um, so here I have a graph of the pre-crossover um, time point. So this is where we can really see the, the kind of truest comparison between um, folks who received either the active psilocybin medication or the placebo um, up to seven weeks. And you can see that both groups improved. Uh, so their anxiety and depression uh, scores both went down you know, mostly around the, um, the first drug administration point. But you can see that the psilocybin group in purple improved much more than the um, niacin. And the effects here are pretty large, not as large as, um, as Dr. Davis's, but uh, presented, but significantly larger than most uh, depression, or sorry, SSRI trials, so the kind of gold standard that we have currently in psychiatry, these seem to outperform. And then here um, in the parent study, we looked at outcomes up to, to about 12 months, the 12 month follow up. And um, we see that the effects persist. So the niacin group, the placebo, the people who received the um, niacin first, um, then received psilocybin second. So by the end, everyone had this, received both medications and then they kind of catch up to each other. Um, and as Dr. Davis defines, response rates refer to 50% or more reduction in, you know, in depression, um, and uh, remission rates refer to response plus um, having a certain um, score. So on the on the HADs, um, having a score below seven, and on the um, BDI score below 12. Um, and here you can see that. Um, at the seven week point and then at the um, last time point in the parent study, um, they're very high. So up to 80% you know, or so um, rates of response remission. So now I'm gonna be presenting results from the long-term follow-up study that I led um, that looked at outcomes way out three, about three and a half, four and a half years later. Um, we did not re-administer all the um, outcome measures, but we did look at anxiety, depression, um, hopelessness, demoralization, and quality of life. And we looked at a subsample. In the original study had 29, we looked at 15. Um, and in this study, the groups were combined, so we were not sort of able to compare um, you know, people who had just received psilocybin versus who had just received the placebo. At this point, everyone was lumped together. Um, and here you can see, um, so yeah, the, the groups combined that the outcomes appear to persist. There's a strong suggestion that at um, about three years and four and a half years later, um, the effects are, you know, are uh, participants who um, you know, were involved in the study continue to report that they, um, you know, their anxiety reductions kind of remains. Um, and these effect sizes are, are, are quite large um, within subjects. So compared to their baseline time point and also response and remission rates also very high um, at this point, up to about 80, 60 to 80% or so. And, and then, Persisting effects. This is pretty amazing. That uh, four and a half years, four and a half years later, um, nearly all the participants continue to attribute persisting you know, effects. So, rating their experience as the top single or top five most significant experiences, spiritually significant, personally meaningful experiences of their lives, um, all these years later. So, there's something really powerful about these experiences that continues to. Um, Kind of inform in people's lives all these years later. Um, and this finding is interesting, um, or I, I found very interesting that I graphed here, or we graphed here, um, elapsed time. So essentially how much time, the, the time that had passed since their psilocybin session with um, 
the changes in depression and hopelessness. So here we see that with the greater passage of time, um, um, their scores seem to be improving. So you know, it's kind of interesting to sort of interpret this finding. Again, this is not you know, an authoritative finding. We don't know, there's not a control here, so we can't you know, attribute this to the psilocybin versus other variables. But essentially, we, you know, we might see with, with a treatment like psilocybin that people continue to get better over time, that as time passes, the effects get stronger. Um, so just some quick limitations of the study, or our, both studies, um, a large, I, I would say, a, a very um, concerning um, you know, aspect of many of the academic trials is that most of the participants are um, predominantly white, so we don't have a lot of um, diversity in these trials, and we've taken a more passive approach and not really proactively um, you know, recruited um, you know, people of color. And so I think moving forward, this would be a, a real area um, uh, to, you know, need to, to focus on to really uh, you know, reach, reach those people and, um, and to create more generalizability of our samples. And we also used a crossover design, as I shared, and that um, prohibits the um, ability to really um, attribute any effects to um, to the psilocybin intervention itself, small sample sizes, um, and a you know, control condition. It's hard to really blind um, with placebos the, um, in these trials, given the strong effects of the psychedelic. So now, um, as I wrap up, I'm going to just. Uh, present some qualitative findings and, and then some possible mechanisms that might be at play here from a psychological standpoint. So I also was involved with um, a couple qualitative papers where we interviewed a subset of participants at, um, after their psilocybin sessions and um, I won't read all the quotes. I do have them up here so you can see them, but I do want to sort of point out that many participants describes having um, emotional catharsis, experiencing emotions that they uh, hadn't felt for a long time or had um, kind of repressed for a while. And then um, others reporting this, uh, I'll read this quote, there's a reckoning which came with cancer and this reckoning was enhanced by the psilocybin experience. I have a greater appreciation and sense of gratitude for being alive. Um, and really people sort of coming to terms with their cancer, realizing that they, um, they can grow from the experience and that it provokes you know, a crisis of meaning, but that in the, in the, in the process of grappling with, that, with their disease and with the, the kind of the fear um, that they were able to find new meaning in their lives. And um, so Dr. Davis proposed some you know, really, I think, interesting mechanisms at play. We, you know, we don't really know um, what is happening, but there are some um, compelling theories about what, you know, what might be happening from a sort of therapy process, psychological process perspective. And the ones that I, um, you know, I kind of find most interesting um, is, are these here acceptance of emotion or acceptance of one's experience instead of avoidance. So we know that avoidance of situations that can be painful or painful emotions can help in the short term, but in the long term can often um, be harmful. You know, the more we try to avoid some experiences, the more we close ourselves off to new experiences and to living. So for people in the study, um, trying to control um, their emotions, um, you know, realizing that Try, instead of trying to control, they could you know, accept their experience and that might be a better strategy. Another one here, um, mindfulness. Um, people have described, and participants in the study have described, um, while under the influence of psilocybin, being able to um, kind of develop a more spacious, expansive um, sort of sense of um, themselves and also their kind of thoughts and mental phenomena. And from this perspective, they can kind of perceive new ways of thinking and perceiving and feeling can arise and they're freed from these kind of constriction, constricted narratives, conditioned sort of narratives about themselves. Um, and they're able to 
um, kind of develop a, uh, a more sort of detached perspective um, and shift from more of the contents of their experience to more of a process, um, kind of letting go of these rigid narratives of themselves in the world. Another um, theory about psychological flexibility, Dr. Davis presented, uh, or, um, he published a paper recently that found the correlation between psychological flexibility, which refers to um, this kind of ability to um, have a more open perspective, a process that helps people manage stressors without being so rigid. Um, and then, you know, with regard to cancer, finding ways to cope with the cancer, seeing cancer as an opportunity um, to create more meaning, to develop new um, uh, kind of behaviors that are in line or more congruent with their deeper, deeply held values and our, our qualitative research really supports that idea. So um, I will end with just some, some acknowledgements. Uh, we have a very large team. I wasn't able to sort of include everyone in here, but um, yeah, we could not have done this work without, um, without the amazing team um, at NYU and our study participants. And um, I will now hand it over to Dr. Glick and answer questions. I think that we're going to have a Q&A session soon. Awesome. Thank you. Daniel, Thank you. Do, I, do you go ahead and do, how do we start this? Um, well, your bio is my favorite of all of them. OK, great. So I'll read your bio and thank you, Gabrielle. Um, I appreciate um, yeah, the wide variety of um, methodologies that you, that you use. But uh, Gianni, Gianni Glick, I'm a psychiatry register, resident at Stanford University with an interest in psychedelic research, therapy, and education. Boom. Boom. <laughs> I, I gotta keep it brief. Yes. Okay. Um, great. Well, so I'm, I'm Gianni, as Anna said, I'm a psychiatry resident at Stanford. Um, I'm thrilled to, to share the stage here with uh, Alan and Gabby or Dr. Davis and Dr. Agan Leibs. And this is like the perfect, it's like a slow pitch down the middle for my talk, which will be less data driven, more theory driven, less pretty slides, but more ideas crammed into a small space. So uh, bear with me as we, as we go through this. For the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about psilocybin therapy how it appears to increase a particular kind of well-being rooted in meaning and connectedness, and how this in turn may be affecting our gene expression in a way that reduces inflammation. Um, okay, so assuming the slides work. Cool, okay. So to start, I just wanna set some context. So we're gonna start the story in the late 90s with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And basically, there were 17,000 adults and they asked, what kind of adverse experiences did you have as a child? And what they found was that the more adversity, which was abuse or neglect, or a parent say that which was who was incarcerated, the more adversity as a child, the greater your risk later in life for depression and anxiety and addiction. But what was surprising was that they found that the more adversity as a child also predicted greater risk for physical illness later in life, diabetes, heart disease, cancer. And so this question came up, how does social adversity, social pain get under the skin and become biological disease years later? And so one of the ideas, one of the ideas to link these is inflammation. So that's where we'll start. And so inflammation has been linked now to many different types of stress and adversity, ranging from these, these childhood experiences to PTSD, to bereavement. And these are all, what these have in common, you might say, is a protracted period of uncertainty or perceived threat. So now let's zoom in to one of these particular risk factors, one of these types of stress, which is one of the most robust predictors of poor health outcomes, which is social isolation or loneliness. So in 2007, Steve Cole at UCLA um, took a group of people and he gave them a loneliness scale. And he compared the group the, uh, of that group, those who were most lonely, with those who are least lonely or most socially integrated. And he said, what is the differential gene expression of these two groups? And as a super quick biological uh, background, 
every cell in your body has the exact same DNA, with some exceptions, like germ cells. But the reason that the skin on your ankle looks and functions differently than the, your heart cells and your brain cells is because they're expressing different genes. And not only does gene expression determine the kind of cell it is, but it also determines how that cell responds to the environment. So basically, here you can see in the graph, red is upregulation of a gene, more expression, green is downregulation. The takeaway here is that those who were most lonely had higher, uh, they had more upregulation of this pro-inflammatory gene expression pattern, this coordinated shift toward inflammation. And because the same pattern of inflammatory gene expression was found across different types of adversity and across different species, it got a fancy name, which is, which is the conserved transcriptional response to adversity. Okay, so the question is, why is this happening? Why would your body rev up this, this coordinated shift toward inflammation when it feels threatened? And so we might look to all of human or primate history. But first, what is inflammation? Uh, good, good question. Some of you out there may have a better answer than me, but basically it is the start of the immune response and it's our first line of defense against injury. So throughout evolutionary time, it made sense for our immune system, given limited resources, to tune in to our social circumstance to try to predict what kinds of things it's going to need to respond to. So if you're out there and you're being chased by this saber-toothed tiger, I don't know how often that actually happened, but let's say you are, you're going to rev up your adrenaline fight or flight response, and this is going to um, uh, generate the inflammatory shift, which is going to rev up inflammation in preparation for injury, defense, and wound repair. It's been shown to be helpful for those things. Now, that made sense in that environment when the threats were transient and physical. But today, we're not running from tigers. We're stuck in traffic. We're feeling rejected or isolated. And so the same programmed reflex of our genes is now become now leads to this chronic infl inflammatory state which is fertilizer for the chronic diseases that kill most of us heart disease cancer copd etc and this is a busy slide which is basically attempting to map how this kind of social experience is converted to gene expression and, it, and the short story is it's it's through your sympathetic nervous system signaling Okay, so we know the bad news, um, but, the, but the, the question then is, can this become a target of our intervention? Can this, can this coordinated shift of, of gene expression be reversed or at least buffered? And the short answer is yes. So if you measure people's blood, and by the way, this is inflammation in particular white blood cells. So if you measure the white blood cells before and then six or eight weeks after yoga, tai chi, qigong, and the CBT stress management, you find that in fact, this inflammatory gene response is reversed or at least decreased, which is good news. This is just one of my favorite trials. Really quickly, essentially, if you do three kind acts every day for a month, you will have decreased inflammatory gene expression when we measure after the fact. Speaking to this idea of a pro-social um, uh, uh, intervention leading to more connectedness, decreasing the sense of uh, threat-related inflammation. Okay, so now we know, we know that loneliness and threat predict this pro-inflammatory gene expression. We know that it is responsive to intervention. Now the question is, what kind of psychological states might be protective against this pro-inflammatory state? And for this, we're gonna ask Terence McKenna. Just kidding, this is Aristotle. So Aristotle comes up with this idea of eudaimonic well-being, which was his way of saying, living your life in accordance with your highest virtue. So in the late 80s, a psychologist, Carol Riff, tried to modernize this concept of eudaimonic well-being. To do that, she looked at um, some of the, the best wisdom from psychological thinkers and writers over the last century and said, what do they all have in common? What, do they all, um, what are the points of convergence of all these theories about what makes the good life? What is well-being? And she arrived at this six-dimensional construct, which is, which is this pie chart in the middle here, self-acceptance, purpose in life, Etc. Here's a quick definition. Eudaimonic well-being encompasses a sense of purpose and meaning in life, social embeddedness, and the potential for personal growth. Okay. Um, and this is just a, a brief flyby of some data, which is to show that this kind of meaning and connectedness, this eudaimonic well-being, has been shown across time, across
across demographics, across study populations to indeed be correlated with this anti-inflammatory profile. Okay, but this is not the eudaimonia summit, this is the psilocybin summit. So where does psilocybin come in? Uh, I, I'll just skim by this. I think this audience is familiar. There's been this resurgence of um, psychedelic uh, research. These are just a few uh, of, the, of the trials, graphs from the trials, which show that psilocybin therapy um, at least preliminarily appears to be uh, very effective for different kinds of distress. But maybe most remarkably is not only does it show symptom reduction, but a lot of the people in these trials, um, many of whom are psychedelic naive, report that six, 12 months later, say that this is one of the most meaningful experiences of their lives. This is a very commonly reported finding and um, uh, the two previous presenters were part of this work um, or part of the teams given, giving rise to this work. So we're left with some questions. Why do we see such large effect sizes, which we just saw? Um, why is it that it's working for things as different as depression and uh, anxiety related to, to dying uh, and, and quitting smoking? And why do we see these effects last for up to four years, as Gabby just showed us? So, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some more piggybacking here, um, but one method of trying to investigate why this is happening is you ask them, you interview the people involved, this is the qualitative literature, and you've already heard some ways of bringing that together. Um, this is my take on it, that when you look at all of them and you put it together, essentially the people are reporting increases in connectedness, increases in self-acceptance and a greater sense of meaning and purpose in life. And when you look at this, it looks a whole lot like this. And if you put that under some scrutiny and you look at each of the six dimensions and then you take a study one at a time, the study, you can find evidence of participants reporting each of these experiences. And if you do this for all of the literature, you get this graph, which you should never show in a PowerPoint presentation. This is just to demonstrate that there's evidence for this. Um, okay, which it leads to our hypothesis, which, which is that psilocybin therapy um, may increase, or sorry, may reduce the inflammatory gene expression. And it may do this by increasing eudaimonic well-being, connectedness, and meaning. But the question remains, why exactly would psilocybin therapy increase eudaimonia? And I propose that it has to do with changing our model of the world and how we fit into it. So it may be that we're walking around with a model of the world that looks something like this. You're there, you're, you're at home or wherever uh, as yourself, bounded in space and time. And over there is the world and everyone else separate. And this is what people report. So these are participant quotes um, about prior to psilocybin therapy, how they felt. I felt so alone, I felt isolated, the prison of my brain, etc. And so the question is, might psilocybin be changing the model from this to something that looks more like this? And in fact, this is what people report. So it's not an all powerful world uh, and universe against me, a sense of we're all in the same boat. And I go totally nuts with the quotes because I can't subtract them. I like them all. This is my favorite, I'll just read. It's the first time I ever really felt like I was part of the world instead of separate from it. So what does feeling part of the whole and feeling connected have anything to do with health? So let's ask the fish. So for any social species from sardines to humans, being on the social perimeter is extremely risky for survival. So to the extent that being a part of the group was essential for survival, our brains, our, our, our brains will be exquisitely tuned into the ways in which we are or we are not part and participating in the social tribe and tapping into deeply wired neural circuitry of harm and risk and safety and connection. Which essentially is saying, what is the difference in our nervous system with this model, the isolated versus this model, the connected? And this is an attempt to summarize uh, two decades of social neuroscience in uh, one and a half slides, which is, looks something like this. If you feel isolated, you have increased uh, uh, threat sensitivity. You're hyper vigilant for social threat. Your defense systems are engaged. Your fight or flight systems are pumping adrenaline down into the cells. Your genes have this programmed reflex toward this inflammatory state in preparation for defense attack and healing from the injury it might incur. 
Conversely, if your model of the world looks like this, you are connected, you're engaging your safety neural circuitry, your affiliative, your caregiving systems, and you're experiencing the elements of eudaimonic well-being. And both of these are affecting your gene expression. Now, the problem is, uh, and we're rounding third base, heading for home here, um, this is not just happening at one point in time. This continues to happen in an ongoing process. So what happens to you today is going to affect you tomorrow and so on. So when you have an inflammatory response, the proteins that are made from that response are affecting your behavior. Things like sickness behavior, when say you feel ill and you're more withdrawn and you're less motivated and that looks a whole lot like depression. And biologically, those proteins that are made from this response are forming the cells in your brain, which are the perceptual apparatus you're using to perceive the world. I think this is best summarized in, in this, um, which again is summarizing a ton of data. Each of these arrows in this graph is based on empirical findings. I think it's the hypothesis is that it has a lot to do with inflammation. So if you perceive the world if you perceive yourself to be social, socially isolated, you're gonna have an implicit hypervigilance for more threats. And if you're hypervigilant, you're going to tune into the ways which the world is unsafe and it is threatening. And if you're more tuned into that perception, you're going to behave accordingly. And if you behave accordingly, you might be more withdrawn, um, then the world is going to respond in such a way and you're more likely to have these negative social interactions, thus perpetuating this cycle. And the idea, the hope, the hypothesis is that psilocybin therapy might disrupt this vicious cycle and instead create a virtuous cycle. So instead of feeling socially isolated, you have the feeling that there's a connection to everyone. So instead of being hypervigilant for threat, you're inclined to believe that the world is safe. And so you feel like, and these are more participant quotes, you feel like you could reach out to anybody and connect with them. And because this is what you're biased to believe, this is what you're, you are tuning into ways in which the world is safe and you are part of it, you could see that everyone was essentially good. And if people are good, you are more likely to hold the door open, to say thank you, to give up your seat, to look somebody in the eye, to say thank you. And this in turn creates more positive social interactions. The social world conforms and responds. So you might then have a sense of ease where previously you felt anxiety and discomfort. And this, of course, propagates the idea that there's some kind of connection and you're part of something. So part B of the hypothesis is that some of these sustained improvements we see up to four years later might have to do with this virtuous cycle of decreased inflammation that affects our behavior in this pro-social direction, which then goes back and makes us less inflamed and so on and so on propagating through time. This is just a theory for now. This is a hypothesis. There's some data. I just snagged this slide from your talk, Dr. Davis. I hope that's okay while you're talking. But essentially, we would like to put this to the test. This is what Source Research Foundation uh, gave the grant for. If you poke people's arms before psilocybin therapy, you can measure inflammation in their blood, and, if you can, and then you measure it afterward, and you can put this hypothesis to the test. And I propose that if, in fact, psychedelic or psilocybin therapy does reduce inflammation, this becomes a public health imperative. And we might have a safe, time-limited intervention that honors the mind-body connection from the level of worldview to the deepest level of biological regulation, our genes. Thank you. Oh, and this is thank you to Steve Cole, whose work this is a genius, whose work this is heavily based on, and some of the people involved in the qualitative research, and of course, um, source research. Foundation uh, and Stanford. So thank you. And in, any questions, I'm happy to, to chat. Will you stop screen sharing? Will you turn off the screen sharing? Yes, I will. Uh, uh, and Dan, pause. do we have, I know we're at our hour. Do we have time just to make one more plug for SRF or do people need to go on to their next thing? Um, you can make a plug for SRF. And what I was going to actually ask, and you guys can say no, um, maybe you'll take Q&A to the Discord channel. Are you guys open to maybe going over? There's a research channel and you guys can, you know, talk to folks and I'll put the uh, link in here. 
That'd be great. I've also been answering a bunch of the Q&A in uh, Zoom for those of you who wanted to take a look at it. And I just wanted to shout out uh, uh, Gabby and Gianni are two of our grant recipients um, at Source Research Foundation. For those of you who don't know about SRF, it's uh, uh, so far has been limited to just student grants. Uh, we fund graduate and, and uh, graduate students all across the country and more recently uh, internationally who want to study psychedelics across lots of different topics from anthropology to psychiatry to psychology. Um, starting in 2021, we will have specialty grants specifically for people of color in research. Um, and we're going to unveil a new community grants program for people who want to bridge science and communities uh, in whatever way makes sense to them. And we'll have specific uh, grants for people of color and community, as well as um, uh, lots of other types of folks. So uh, we'd love for people to get connected to us. Um, we hope to continue growing and, and getting uh, our reach as much as possible to connect everyone together. So. Uh, thank you, Stan, for having us and, and letting us represent Source Research Foundation today. Indeed. And as somebody who struggles with inflammation and also the difference between pronoia and paranoia, I really appreciate your talk, Gianni. Are you familiar with pronoia? Well, it's basically what you said. It's the opposite of paranoia. It's the deep-seated belief that the universe is conspiring to shower you with blessings. <laughs> it's really, really lovely stuff. So hopefully we'll see you guys in Discord. I really appreciate all of all of your talks, and I appreciate all 450 of you for showing up. Um, and I'll see you at the next talk with um, Simon Eugler. We'll be talking about the hero's journey. And I believe that Andy will be rejoining us at 3.30 for Omalewa's talk. And so um, we'll you. have ASL for that. All right. Thank you guys very much. Much love. Um, donate to Source Research. <laughs>